Got a treat for you guys today. In today's episode, I'm hanging out with my buddy John Keevil of Warbringer and talking about their new album, Weapons of Tomorrow, which comes out worldwide on Napalm Records, April 24th, 2020. I know it's been some time since you've seen your boy Chris. I've missed you guys. I hope everyone's doing well. Hope you're staying safe out there, especially one stick length away. It's shit out there. There's no two ways around it. All your favorite shows are canceled. Can't see any of your homies. You can't go skate. Times are tough right now, which is why this video is brought to you by our friends over at Ridge Wallet. Ridge Wallet is the ultimate key for a sleek and faster designed wallet. With speed and power unsurpassed, you need this wallet. It's gonna fit in your front pocket and ditch that big bulky thing that your ex-girlfriend got you. You don't need that anymore. This carries around only the essentials that you need. Forget carrying around old receipts, ditch the bulky, go sleek, mosh with speed and power unsurpassed with the Ridge Wallet. And if you use a promo code, Jayhoff, you can get 10% off your order. Free shipping worldwide, lifetime warranty, and if you really don't like it, send it back. Link in the description, 10% off for you guys. Okay, here we go. We are online. Warbringer and Jayhoff films. It's like take fucking five or six or something. Version uh, six, seven, eight. We're completely out of ideas, so let's just hang out again, Chris. Let's do the same shit we always do, man. Yeah! <laughs> So Glorious End came out today. What the fuck? Holy shit. Chris, man, the, you remember one time in Toronto after a show, uh, we were at a bar and I like drank too much and started like going off about that song, which existed only in my head at the time. It yeah. now exists. It's like I gave birth to an idea because I, I did, you know, it's out of my figurative womb and into the world and it feels great. Go forth, be strong, fly free, young song, you know, <laughs> fucking a dude. And like the lyric video fucking. You guys, I love the aesthetic you guys have got for everything for this album cycle so far. I'm just, oh my god, it's so, it's so, ah. I've been it's, really hands-on about that. This lyric video, I drew, I wrote up like a three-page treatment, and I sent like 150 different photos and like video links and stuff to be like, this time period, this aesthetic. We're talking Napoleon into the Great War. We want that like the old world marching off to die in the trenches kind of vibe. Yeah, and man, it, <laughs> it come at a better time too while we're all sitting here waiting for the next instructions about what to do. What's it like over there? Have you been grocery shopping yet? Uh, we did at the beginning of this thing. We've done a remarkable job of staying bunkered up, honestly, and we have eaten every single meal with the exception of one uh, burrito run that I did while I was out doing laundry. Um, <laughs> that, you know, so that's the one, and I didn't ask or consult the wife on this. I was just like, burritos, we're doing it. It's, a, it's our God-given right, because we live in Southern California to have delicious burritos. For, but it's very strange. Like, if you go walking around here, the streets are empty. It's like what I'd like uh, the streets in the town I lived in to be like, where there's a car passing here and there, but it's not like the usual wall of traffic in every street, every corner. I feel, dude, there's no one around here anymore. And we went to go grocery shopping the other day, and we we had we were told one per household, and we had to stand six feet away from each other, and it sucked because I was trying to film in the grocery store because I have this. See, so when into quarantine, the hockey. That's like. Canadian method of quarantine right there. Man, how much weed you got on you right now? We're allowed to do None. this. None! I'm out, dude! I'm out! <laughs> hold on, I smoked the rest of it. Dude, you're gonna... If you can throw me weed, you should go and fucking join Major League Baseball, man. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing making YouTube videos? You can make a lot more money doing that. You'll be famous oh. as shit if you could throw a pitch of a, a dime bag or whatever from Toronto to L.A. And with accuracy, shit, then the military's going to want to contact you. How the fuck did you do that? <laughs> just stand just stand on your front lawn waiting with a baseball glove waiting for it to come in for God knows and, how many hours. Just lands in the glove. So, okay, what have, what have you been watching so far? Okay, so we did half of Tiger King, actually, on your recommendation. Do you think Joe Exotic likes thrash metal? Do you think he would do Joe Exotic? Because he did some music. Do you think he'd do Tiger-themed thrash metal, perhaps? Is Tiger that something you think you'd convert him onto? We can, we can, we can definitely. When he's out of jail, we're going to pitch that to him. We're going to write him a letter. 
and I'm not talking about like a more distorted cover of Eye of the Tiger. I'm talking original, unique material that is deeply exploring the realm of tigers, you know, like uh, like Watership Down, but for tigers instead of rabbits. And that's the perspective of the singer. He's a tiger living in the jungle. What are his struggles? What's on his mind, you know? You know oh, of the jungle! Okay. <laughs> out of my ass to you there it is <laughs> hey you want to join my band we're called Sabretooth. Sabretooth, there you go dudes that's how we cash in on the popularity of tiger king there it is the marketing scheme of thrash future glory dude okay so when are you going <laughs> to put that in an episode of uh science of thrash Science of Thrash is actually specifically a look behind Weapons of Tomorrow. So it's it, there's going to be exactly ten episodes, and I think to, uh, so. I think we're going to release like two or three. There's one going to come out for Glorious End in a day or two, and uh, maybe a longer. I don't know exactly, but we filmed them already. They exist. It's kind of our attempt to do like something the equivalent of like a Netflix docu series about our own record. I wrote a fucking 17 page script for the science of thrash. I fucking did that and broke the record down. Here's a real uh, like video breakdown of all the detail and the music and on this record. So you can really like sink your teeth into it. It really sucks because we put, I put, you know, we put a lot of heart and soul and work into weapons of tomorrow and now we're going to put it out and we can't tour on it. And that's, you know, that's not good for the release of the record, as you might imagine. It's not what we would normally do. Normally we'd be touring within like a week of release. You know, that's what was going to happen. That's like the one thing I've been doing in quarantine is a bunch of video interviews like the, like this one. But most of them are less silly, which uh, this is this is nice. <laughs> but it just sucks not to be able to go out on the road and, and hit it and play these songs that we're really proud of in front of people. And it also sucks to know, yeah, this this could easily hurt the record. But, you know, we decided not to push the release date back we felt that would also hurt the record because it had already been announced singles had already come out we ready to hit this big boy here we go uh trans like canada usa alliance of thrash here yeah okay so let's get into what okay what are you cooking these days what's cooking up at your place so I cooked a mushroom risotto. Uh, so, so basically I, I I get a lot of this fr from Noel here. Uh, I mostly handle like the grilling aspects we'll often tag team it and then sometimes like one of us or the other will do it. we don't know how this long this thing's gonna last so we want to be efficient with our resources so uh in that interest we've just been cooking a ton and we stock up on like utilitarian food items a lot of vegetables a lot of like rice and pasta with something uh some tortilla stuff We'll do like these big pork roasts. We got two giant uh, pork shoulders. We did in a crock pot for like three hours uh, with a bunch of different seasons. It was like spicy and sweet and tangy kind of. Uh, and that was good. You know, we, we always have a supply of like onions and garlic and stuff like that because that's mm -hmm. just cheap and it's good with everything. <laughs> so uh, pretty much everything I make has that in it <laughs> to, to some nice. extent. We do a lot of like red bell peppers and shit, and I do a lot of grilling. Uh, I got something that's awesome is I got a grill. Uh, I need to fix it, man. But uh, it's a charcoal grill that has a like a propane in tank attachment. And so instead of having to use lighter fluid, you can just use the propane tank. And I, I went and stocked up on like five of these little propane tanks, and then the fucking valve stopped working. I don't know why. When's Warbringer going to have one of the front flipping hats man maybe we should i don't know that's we kind of we kind of never did because you know actually part of our whole thing was that we didn't want everyone being like you guys are a retro thrash band we're like we're never trying to do this as a tribute actually we wanted to write legitimately cool songs you know so mm -hmm. uh and it took us a while i think it only happened around like empires woe to the vanquished uh empires because it's a weird record that uh, you know does a bunch of weird shit <laughs> and uh then vanquished because i think it was like very solidified around a unique warbringer sound that you know really put together and stuff in a way we hadn't been able to do before but i think like first three records man it was like we would just be like i, I saw so many reviews and stuff would be like straight written off for just uh oh this is like a retro band they just like do a list of thrash band it sounds like 
te- testament creator, son of destruction, death angel, uh, etc. You know, and, and with, I even saw shit like with vocals like the guy from Anthrax and stuff. I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> you know, like it, it, there's valid comparisons you could make, but it wouldn't be that. You know, and nothing against uh, Anthrax, which is, I, I fucking enjoy their records, but you know, not that. But it's like that's not what I sound like. You know, uh, yeah. but it's fucking. Uh, so we always tried to like in a lot of what we wrote and did tried to like get out of being thrown in with like retro thrashings because of the way that was always portrayed. And we're like, man, I, this was never like a silly jokey thing to me of the actual music itself. This was always something I'm like, this is the fucking best metal dude. You know, I, this is, there's brilliant songs here, brilliant guitar work, amazing drumming, you know? So often great, like, uh, you know, shit around like like no reason to exist from extreme aggression. Those are great lyrics, man. You know, there's it captures something you feel in society. You know, it's, it's a real thing that I, I think is like legitimate art. And so I I never liked. I, I always tried to write serious stuff about real stuff that was kind of in opposition, I guess, ideologically to the the beer and party uh, like pizza stuff, which is funny because I like pizza and beer and party <laughs> a decent amount. But it's just not what I'm about artistically, I guess. So mm-hmm. there's a long-winded explanation like all my others. <laughs> it would be rad, though, if it just said, like, war underneath and you had the W on the, like... Maybe w- we should. Hey, hey man, w you know. The and then, like, war or something. I don't know to say. Yeah, well, now I'll, I'll do it this way. All right. We're doing yeah. this. Well, okay. now it's on top of the headphones, so it doesn't really fit at all. And my head uh, looks like perhaps I'm uh, about halfway to cone heads, but I'm not there yet. I didn't go whole hog, so I didn't make the cut. I'm not on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Man, you remember what we do every day on tour? Just wake and bake and talk about shit? Yeah, we like wake and bake and like do uh, intermit- okay. <laughs> intermittent uh, like workout stuff and like walk around and get food. It was pretty yeah. fun, man. I enjoyed having you on there. <laughs> yeah, the, the documentary thing came up. We, we didn't, like, talk about that, but the, the Firepower Cools Tour documentary. Do- mm-hmm. Documentary. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, that came out really fun. I, I really liked that. Dude, yeah. me too. And it was, like, I had so much, like, that was my first time just, be, like, filming solo tool. So I was just, I was so fucking happy just to, like, be there and everything. Holy crap. The Montreal mm-hmm. show was fucking epic. There were, yeah. <laughs> what was that one city where that guy fully passed out in front of the merch table? Was that Trois Rivières? Yeah, that was not the greatest <laughs> show, but that was uh, that was kind of the epitome. I, mean, I think I took a picture of the dude. Yeah, we put like a tips picture on his head, took a picture of it. You know? Yeah. Nothing well, bullish, it's just silly, but yeah. That was so much fun. Fuck, man. Oh, so you guys are on going to be so in December with Destruction and Crisis, yes? Yeah, uh, so that's... I guess the what people are asking me in, in interviews and such is, uh, are you sure that this will happen? And can I really say yes? So uh, basically, mm-hmm. if circumstances allow, which I really fucking hope they do, and I hope that it clears up. And like, I, I hope for first more so than for the sake of our tour, for the sake of the world and people in general, I hope this passes and we can all get back to life as, as as normal and hopefully be safe, healthy, and prosperous and all that stuff that you would wish upon any human. But uh, apart from that, I'd really like to tour and play on this record because I'm really I really like Weapons of Tomorrow, so I want to play it for people. I want to try out some of these songs live, and I just want to get back out there and you know push the Warbringer name forward as as always. So. Re, you know, it's like I'm a knight trying to go on a quest, and I'm stuck in winter quarters, and there's snow, and I can't go anywhere. I'm just like, ah, you know, <laughs> like waving my question. sword at the horizon fu- in a futile gesture of rage. Like, what? Is- Let me do my purpose. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I mean, that's what I'm here. So, you know, I, I'm a, I'm trying to make the best of it. I learned to cook. I've read some cool stuff. Uh, watched some cool stuff. Um, oh yeah, other stuff to watch. Uh, so I, I like Rick and Morty season four. I generally enjoy that show. Mm-hmm. I um, have a season four. Is it any good? I thought so. I thought they pretty much kept the standard of what they do well. And my favorite things about the show aren't like the the shouting pickle Rick or whatever. I really like how they pretty much go through a what's what of all the concepts in great sci-fi novels, and they give you the like philosophical side of sci-fi in these crazy scenarios they draw up in the multiverse. That's mm-hmm. pretty cool. Uh, and like 
stuff like philosophical implications of insignificance in the multiverse, that whole like nobody exists on purpose bit. That's actually pretty good phil- philosophy right there. You know, good job, Rick and Morty. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, so I like I like that they have that stuff and they're able to use their kind of like absurd and colorful package with the the, the likable wacky characters to get some some cool legitimate ideas across and, and you know i think the writing's funny and they have they, they have cool ideas so that's a fun like that that one i think is fun uh apparently there's a thing with the fan base i'm too like i see on the internet people don't like the fan base of this show but i'm actually too isolated to uh, know what the hell the other fan base of the show is generally like, it seems like it's overall relatively popular. Uh, I don't know. I like it. <laughs> so you want okay? If you had to smash a brick with, with your face, what band would you listen to? Uh, if, there's a few. Yeah. I, I'd put on the list for smash brick with face. My criteria is basically aggressive, pummeling, bludgeoning. So my good old standby epidemic of violence is on that list. I really like the first Jungle Rod album, Slaughter of the Week, for just like pure feel like a gorilla, you know, like that. So that's very good. Just like if you want to devolve your mental state and be angry at the same time, it's it, which kind of feels awesome when you're just like in that mood, you know. Um, I also would mention Sepultura. Probably Beneath the Remains is the most, like, bludgeon out of all of them, but Arise Air has stuff on uh, Schizophrenia fits the bill as well. And then I guess, like, the next couple albums they do, like, a Chaos 80 or something, yeah, that's pretty, like, like territory or something. That's pretty primal, like, Ugh. so that, that shit, I, I personally really like that record as well. Oh, you mentioned Coma of Souls earlier. Now, Coma of Souls is a more, like, winding, uh, intricate kind of track but that opening storm of riffs to me is some of the th- stuff of thrash legend and i think mm-hmm. world beyond is a really underrated song on that record that's both a total ripper and has this kind of like all- melodic almost like epic quality in the chords in the chorus and, and just the riff sequence and everything mm-hmm. so i really like that one too uh, but that that album in general is one of that and extreme aggression i think are probably the like my favorite ones from that band um pretty far up there for me honestly those are more like intricate and stabby and slicey to me uh than straight bludgeon but mm-hmm. uh very aggressive uh what else bludgeon's really hard dude Fire a lot of by power trip yeah that's true that band in general is a bludgeoner i, I think that's a good one dad so just like put your head into something and hit it with a rock you know like break rock with skull kind of band yeah do you i think you, you guys would ever go on tour together we would yeah <laughs> Hey, dude, we we would love to tour with bands that have you know like a heavy and thrash audience in general. That's that's kind of our mo. We'll take we'll take what we get that's uh, that's good and advantageous that we're, where we can successfully play in front of an audience. That's basically our goal, <laughs> you know. Fuck yeah, you guys on a bill would absolutely. Oh, who else would you want to be on a bill with right now if you could drop everything and go on tour? Dude, basically uh, like modern extreme and thrash metal acts like go down the list we'd like to tour with them you know you name it uh to, to be honest uh th- that's the point is like uh, touring it's, it's about getting the like just playing in front of people doing what we do in front of it so uh honestly we've done we did some weird tours in our time it has worked uh we did like fin troll in 2009 after we put out waking into nightmares doesn't what? exactly sound like folk metal yeah we opened for fin troll on a u.s tour full u.s tour uh, we shared a bus with them. They were they were wonderful dudes. I really liked them. Nice. Uh, yeah, uh, but that's a weird one. Hey, you know what the connection is when you're watching it at a live show? Both are high adrenaline things. You know, you can drink a beer to both of those. So it's not as like wild as you think. You still have fucking guitars and like microphones and amplifiers and all the shit. Shit. So it's like uh, th- it's not as wild as you think to have like heavily differing music things. Or we did the Warbringer Enforcer tour twice uh in in the u.s and that's like a seemingly weird pairing because they have influence from stuff as far afield as like you know motley crew or scorpions and stuff like that and uh yeah you know which i enjoy a fair bit of that kind of music uh so that's not what we do but it's like it's high energy high adrenaline metal so that's the common ground and that makes it work it, it 
Exodus, Death Angel, Testament, you know, Creator, you name them. We'd love to tour with all of them. We know a bunch of these fellows, actually. Uh, we'd love to do some stuff if we could, like like Behemoth or, or fucking like Arch Enemy, which we've done before. That was good. Uh, or we could do like a, a Monomar. That would be like good for the band and stuff to do that. Reach out to the, those groups' audiences. Those are like successful mainstream metal acts. So we, we'd love to do that kind of shit. Uh, you mentioned exodus earlier and uh gary holt was what he was mixing mastering or helping you guys record uh wait um uh, waking into nightmares he was he was the producer on waking into yeah. nightmares gary holt was the executive producer on waking into nightmares he was in the studio we had an engineer as well um and it, named adam who was fantastic and uh we had uh actually Tom Hunting showed up and helped set up Nick Ritter's drum kit. Nick Ritter, rest in peace, who did that one performance on record. A really talented drummer, something like the thrash equivalent of Neil Peart, I would say. His guy just peeled out on technical and progressive drumming and put that in with the Warbringer sound. I think that changed the band fundamentally and made us a more unique thrash mm -hmm. outfit because we had that aspect of heavily rhythmic and intricate drumming that wasn't on the early records. And I think that's different mm -hmm. and kind of different from the the 80s approach in general though though it has its roots in that i would say <laughs> yeah because you get certain stuff like uh, certain moments of like drum innovation and thrash a big one strikes me as a uh, dark angel death is certain life is not those kick drum patterns under the verse those bursts that's really like something you don't hear that's a new step they've taken it from like you know you're fast as a shark kind of double kick uh, you know, where it's the straight pattern, do it, you know, being able not just to haul ass, but then to haul ass in controlled rhythmic bursts and stuff that opens up a lot of the later stuff that happens in thrash and then death metal. And, uh, you know, to that kind of rhythmic intricacy, because metal, extreme metal in general at that time, like moves away from melody and towards rhythm as a mode of like getting music across. And it gets really, really rhythmic. And a lot of that brick face stuff we were talking about is very much in line with eschewing melody in favor of just a lot of like dominating rhythm you know mm -hmm. yeah nice. so some 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 thrash analysis for you thrash analysis man you, uh, analysis okay. of thrash th th analysis that doesn't sound as good as thrash analysis so there it is it's, it's a bit funky but whatever is that going to be the name of your autobiography and like <laughs> What would I be a thranalyzer then? A thrash thrash analyzer? I don't know. That not a no sound any good. <laughs> we'll come back to that. We'll figure something. Out. Uh, thrash analyst, the flannelist. That sounds it's better so actually. But then that, that's if I that's if I was like an analyzer of uh, of early '90s grunt rock, which I, I could do to a degree actually. But uh, mm. so you know, I, I could be a if you want a catchy name, I could be a flannelist. I like Allison James the best of the main grunge bands, and Soundgarden's my second place. Someone asked me this recently in an interview, so uh, there you go. And then I rank Nirvana, and then Pearl Jam's at the bottom. Still a pretty good band, but uh, I, I like I prefer the other the other three, and then Allison James' clear favorite for me. The songwriting is just great. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the poor Lane Staley, Staley burns out like a shooting star. And the new records are actually pretty fucking good. I, I, was, I just fucking forget the guy's name, but he's fantastic. So, sorry, sir. I think your records are great. You know? Okay, so you guys have a skateboard that, you got, that you're selling for... As, is it a part of the bundle for the new album? I think so. You know, uh, I, I don't know every existing marketing bundle because I'm not, I'm not the guy buying the record. But oh. I actually uh, had a hand in a lot of the design of the stuff. That's something. The whole red blue thing is something I engineered between Woe to the Vanquish and Weapons of Tomorrow. And you notice that we have a blue blue and silver box set in contrast to the red and gold one. We got a blue and silver flag in contrast to the red and gold one. You, you see a theme here. And I got this from, uh, like, think of the Napoleonic Wars or something where you got the French against the British. Blue, red. Blue army, red army. There you go. So we got kind of these two records, which are sort of... Uh, cousins i would say in terms of what we're trying to do with them some similar themes some similar musical lyrical stuff being explored as we're really just digging into this identity of warbringer we've created as like a sort of aggressive but also like epic and we can be progressive can be somber and it can just rip you know something that's yeah. like that sphere is kind of what we've 
I think we've been going with. And so we're, we're really happy with that. And so we did the second record kind of to reinforce that direction, that identity for the band. And to do that, though, I'm kind of trying to ha- present this as if it's like the other side of the coin or like the next stage or evolution, because that's exactly what we're trying to make it be, you know, pretty much the direction of World of the Vanquish, but different and new and exciting and and uh, and. and progress like where we take those ideas and explore them in different ways or further like the black hand reaches out is like basically remain violent is like a one and a half riff song you know uh like two two and a half probably to give it more proper credit but it's like a really really straightforward and simple song and i think with the like police riots and stuff there's a certain like line and inspiration there that made that one really easy to write that that like hit well i think for what it was um Mm -hmm. But, you know, so we're like, we're not going to do that the same way. We don't have the same thing going on. We don't have the same idea. We, we wouldn't do the same idea. So to do a mid pace heavy song, though, on this one, we're like, what if we made it more like a, a little more? The riff is a little more intricate, more sports, it's a little more technical and involved. And so we went I went with this clandestine kind of theme eventually because, uh, well, that may, that kind of fit the riff. And it seemed like a good angle to go for this song. So I, I did it. Uh, Franz Ferdinand assassination and the, the Black Hands, a real terrorist group. Actual people got murdered, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think that's, you know, for me that's interesting and cool, um, and makes gives the music a little more weight because it's like, oh, this guy's not just like making bullshit up. It's like you're, you're talking about an assassination. The guy's got a cyanide pill around his neck. Oh, it's real. You know, that's that's a litter. You can just take that literally. That that happened. Uh, At Outer Reaches is like a little sci fi story about some like space colonists fleeing Earth at hyperspeed and they go through the black hole to see what's on the other side because they're fleeing like a dying universe. You know, it somehow was destroyed by technology. And uh, yeah, you know, I keep that vague on purpose <laughs> and uh, throw them out through the black hole. They go through, there's a really heavy riff in the middle where time slows down and it is the black hole riff. So we try to do those visual things with riffs and then we go fast into the chorus again, uh, which is like kind of a melodic soaring thing. And uh, then it's like, oh, well, they find out there's nothing on the other side. Their atoms are just warped and destroyed. There you go. There's your expedition. Uh, Enjoy being confined in the universe you're in, you know? (laughs) So it's sort of like... uh, crushing ending to things which most of the twists of the songs it doesn't like end well that's kind of a thing I, i'd normally i think the only like inspiring twist song is divinity of flesh all yes. the others oh, yeah God. yeah that was adam okay, adam was straight up the driver of that song uh so i wrote oh, around a, that was his title too uh adam was a driver I, I wrote the lyric but uh adam was a driver of the theme and the ideas and we talked about it so adam absolutely that was his baby on the record and he did a great job on it uh we restructured it a number of times and that end section was written during the studio the that end the very last riff. um <laughs> which is I, my favorite part of the song uh, my words will live on all that fit uh so that one was written on we recorded the drum track to midi because we didn't have a demo guitar track because we had just written it the night before and we were already in the studio so mm-hmm. some of the in general were very planned out and meticulous but some of the songs we actually benefit from leaving a certain amount of well we'll fucking get there and figure it out and work it out on the fly so we don't do that for too much because then it would be overwhelming but we leave we do a mixture of like really meticulous planning in our songs versus a little bit of uh well we don't quite know what to do here so we're gonna leave it and we're gonna trust that we'll figure it out and, so, and this has worked very well, actually. I, I wasn't able to work this way before, but it's been kind of something we've done a bit of on the last two records. The entire uh, verse for Defiance of Fate was also written the night before tracking. You know, like Ryan Stimpy and SpongeBob when they zoom in on something and suddenly it's disgusting? That's like, like what oh, happens when you take a photo of yourself sometimes. <laughs> or when a front-facing Simpsons character and their face is all just fucking distorted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, and why are they yellow? We still don't know which state is Springfield in. They're always they're like getting clever about that because they know people want to know what Springfield is, and they're always like Springfield, you know, like about like teasing. 
like they're going to show what state it is and they don't. <laughs> yeah. That's fucking silly how they do that. I like it. There's a lot of fun little things. I think the writing in that show being generally pretty clever they, in their way, they weave a ton of intricate little fucking running plot, like gags and plots into there is, is like what keeps it good, you know? At, at least I, I still like it. Maybe I, maybe I just like it because nostalgia. I don't know. <laughs> I like the early Simpsons stuff. I can, I can. Fuck it's with certainly it. their golden shit, you know? I, I think they do some, I, I still like basically enjoyed it. I mean, it's a fucking cartoon I'm watching on TV, so it's not like, it's not like I'm doing hard labor in the gulag or something. I'm watching a fucking cartoon and it's not so bad, you know? <laughs> yeah. If, okay, what about Futurama? I, I think Futurama does some great, like, philosophical kind of shit. Uh, that last episode they did, man, you know, they, they did some cool stuff. Uh, so I think, you know, it, it's a silly cartoon as well, but I like, I appreciate when, like, entertaining, silly, fun stuff has some, like, depth and quality to the writing. I, I like a lot of characters in Futurama and stuff. Uh, you know, Zoidberg's really fun. I love The Professor. So, uh, you know, th there's fun, all the fun stuff you need in a cartoon like that. I think those ones are like... I've gotten... A, I, I used to like Family Guy a lot, and I've gotten kind of maybe I just like saw the code behind the formula of how they do jokes and I got all turned off to it. I still enjoy it. We still watch it from time to time, but it's like kind of on the, on the when there ain't nothing else and we don't want to like think about stuff list. And then what I do want to think about stuff, I'll go dig around YouTube for like fucking old documentaries from the seventies or some shit, you know, uh, yeah. all this old stuff. And I'll try to get my wife to watch it. And sometimes it's sometimes cool. Well, we saw a great one about old Russia last night and the legends around Ivan, the terrible, the prophecy of lightning as his birth. And then how he will, punish the boy our nobles as he sees fit and it's a cruel rate of blood you know it's fucking real so that's but it's like that his that story reads like it's a fantasy novel from like you know the beginning of some epic thing you would see a show or a video game or something you know the king had gone mad and it's like oh that's they're, they're kind of just ripping that off for like centuries now with that story you know uh and so uh, it's it's cool to see uh and then just some of, like, the costumes and hats and language and shit is neat. And the idea of, like, all these lives lived in conditions radically different from your own, that gets me tripping out, man. You know, what's it like to be, you know, what if you were, like, a 13-year-old Russian peasant girl? That was a lot of people's fucking lives. Or what if what if you're, like, a, ser a house servant to a nobleman or something? Or what if you're the nobleman and, like, you know, you have this problem with your... Uh, you know, you're like the second son who's getting snubbed on inheritance and you're like the guy in one of those TV dramas where it's like, you know, what's my meaning? You have the rule and I was born for it. Ah, you know, like you get that happens in uh, this wonderful show, The Crown, where they, they do all that. You know, the, the pressures and problems of the aristocracy They actually make you convincingly that the actresses who play the fucking queen, both of them are, are goddamn brilliant. And the guy who's uh, Philip in, in the third season is like also brilliant. So if you want some like serious television, you know, that's some good shit uh, <laughs> sometimes. But then I like some dumb mm -hmm. shit, too. You know, I'll, I'll laugh at like like farts are still funny you know <laughs> i don't want to go into it on air but like the dumbest shit like the fundamentally dumbest stuff so as much as all like I, I feel like i might seem like i'm trying to be fucking professor egghead sometimes but uh then uh, then i'm like <laughs> fucking a well dude thank you so much for hanging out and if people like this and respond well to this we'll go and do another episode and if you guys don't know Warbringer has a new album, April 24th. And if you haven't listened to any of the singles, dude, go do it. You're in quarantine. Like, what else are you going to do? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Yeah, it's been good hanging. Uh, this has been more fun than I don't know what the hell else I'd be doing right now. I think I'm going to go cook something because, uh, you know, at least in the next hour or so, because I haven't eaten yet today. I've been doing this shit instead. So uh, I'm running on coffee and weed and nothing else. I need I need some food. Fucking A. Go fucking yeah. <laughs> I do. All right, later. Later. Bye bye. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. You've been great. I've been Chris, Germany's greatest export behind the camera. And Julian, it's been a few months since I've seen my boy. He's at home recovering from his Passover hangover, enjoying a hot bowl of matzo ball soup and watching Curb Your Enthusiasm. Be sure to follow us at Chris Thrash at Jayhoff Films. All the links in the description. Stay safe out there. Stay thrash and make sure to enjoy the new Warbringer album, Weapons of Tomorrow, out now. Thanks so much. Love you guys.